Thank you everyone for signing into our webinar. Um, we are talking about preparing for the CAP H1B lottery for fiscal year 2024, and also about the current economic climate and how, how that might impact CAP H1B season. Um, I'm Miki Matrician, and I am a partner at the Boston office of WR Immigration. And I'm here with my esteemed colleague and partner of the New York office, Naveen Ramambora. So welcome everybody. So I'll talk a little bit about our firm very briefly. At WR Immigration, we specialize in employment-based matters, and we have nine offices throughout the United States and one in Shanghai. And uh, let's see, I wanna also talk about our award-winning technology, Rapid. Um, it is a proprietary technology platform that is built on Salesforce and so is very secure and robust. We combine our high-touch service with this innovative technology and well, really what makes us different is that we don't just process visas and green cards. We work as an extension of HR and global mobility to streamline and strengthen your immigration programs. And our passion really is using technology and dynamic reports and predictive analytics so that we can help you to improve your employees' immigration experience. Um, if you aren't already using Rapid, please feel free to reach out to one of us and we would be happy to schedule the demo. So a little housekeeping here. Um, we're happy to accept your questions through the Q&A feature. Please don't put it in the chat because we may not see it. Um, we would love to field questions through the Q&A feature. And um, if pertinent to the topic we're talking about, we may address it through the um, presentation, but otherwise we hope to reserve time at the end to get to the questions. And then uh, importantly, please note that anything we say during the webinar today is, does not constitute legal advice. Um, please contact one of our attorneys if you have a, a question that's specific to your company or your employee. Okay, here's our roadmap for today. We're first gonna talk about K-1B, CAP H-1B lottery requirements. Basically, you know, what needs to be true to have a successful H-1B case? Uh, Naveen's gonna talk about that and then talk about the lottery itself and how it all works, including all the key uh, milestones in the CAP H1 season. And then I'll also talk about key considerations in how to file an H1 petition, either as a consular petition or change of status. We'll touch on CAP gap protection. And then we're gonna spend the latter portion of the webinar talking about what the H1B season uh, can look like during a recession, including important HR considerations in a restructuring of the corporate organization or reduction in force. And then finally, we'll wrap up with next steps for CAP season. So Naveen, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Mickey, for that introduction and um, welcome everyone to, to our webinar. Um, so the H-1B is the most common popular work visa. Um, the basics of an H-1B is that the position needs to be what's called a specialty occupation. And a specialty occupation is basically one where the job and the employer requires um, the employee to have a specific bachelor's degree um, to do that job. And the bachelor's degree has to be in a specific field. So we often see some pushback from immigration where the degree may be too broad, such as a liberal arts degree or a bachelor of business administration degree. Um, other times when the employer may ask for um, too many potential you know, uh, fields of study that could also be problematic um, from the USCIS's perspective. Uh, for example, um, a business intelligence analyst position, if the um, employer is willing to take anyone with a degree in statistics, mathematics, finance, business administration, computer science, or related field, that is an example of um, a, a requirement that may be too broad um, or too varied from um, an immigration's perspective. Uh, the degree must also be equivalent to a U.S. four-year bachelor's degree. Um, we do need to get the degrees evaluated if the individual has a degree from a university outside the United States. 
And we will often see people who have bachelor's degrees, but upon further review, um, their degree is a three-year degree program from, for example, Australia. And so part of our initial assessment is to make sure that they have the equivalent of that US bachelor's degree. And if they are falling short, um, then we can take a look at their experience and see if we can do what's called an equivalency of a combination of both their education and their experience and, and get an equivalent degree evaluation done. The other factor that's required for an H-1B is the wage requirement, and that wage needs to be what's considered a prevailing wage for that occupation code the metropolitan area where the person will be working, and then also the seniority of the role. So is this an entry-level position? Is this a position that requires a few years of experience? All of those will be taken into consideration when determining what is considered um, the appropriate wage for this individual. The, um, the other consideration that we often see are people are now working from home or working remotely, or they may have multiple work sites, and we just need to make sure that they are meeting the prevailing wage for uh, all the different places where they could be potentially working. Um, and where there is a wage survey issue where there, you know, the prevailing wage may be above what is offered to the individual, we can always look at private wage surveys as well and not rely on the Department of Labor's wage surveys. The Department of Labor does uh, review and um, often increases the wages. This happens every year in July. And so uh, the good thing is that when we're doing the HMB caps, we are able to rely on the wages that are currently available, but just to keep in mind that, um, that it's possible what's considered a wage that's appropriate right now may be different um, a year later. So those are the basic building blocks uh, for the H-1B. Um, and now for the actual H-1B lottery. So the, the lottery is an annual um, event that happens. It's um, it is limited in that there's only 65,000 new H-1B visa numbers that are available every year. And then there's the additional 20,000 um, for people who have graduated with a U.S. master's degree or higher. Um, now, this is for folks who have never been counted towards the H-1B cap, but then you also need to keep in mind that there, there are individuals who are considered cap exempt if they're working for a university or a nonprofit research organization or government research organization. Those individuals are not subject to this annual cap and they can actually file H-1B petitions year round. For everyone else who are uh, subject to this annual cap, they're typically students who are coming off of F1 OPT or graduating on F1 visas, um, individuals who are on L1s, or you know, sometimes companies have individuals working in an affiliate office abroad and they would like to transfer them in the future. And so those are the, the typical um, applicants that we see for the H1B cases, uh, cap cases. Um, moving on to how the H-1B uh, registration works. Uh, so the, the, um, the schedule is that it, it starts running from March um, through June. And so we would like to get started on you know, having individuals identified by December, January, so that we are getting the companies ready to register for, um, for the program when the program opens in March, and then making sure that the individuals who are identified for the H-1B registration and then subsequent petition, if they're selected, that they're all eligible for, for the case. So we want to make sure that um, not only is the position at H-1B um, would meet the requirements for those H-1Bs, or, and also that the individual themselves are qualified for the H-1B. So these are all things that we would like to review through January, February, so that in March, when it's time to do the registration, everything has been reviewed, and we know that these are winnable cases if and when they're selected um, in the lottery. The lottery happens um, at around the end of March and it is done electronically. Um, USCIS randomly selects individuals. They typically do the master's cap people first and then, then the regular cap people. And we start to get notification online 
that um, you know there's been updates on on the account or the cases, and then we start to see the individuals who are actually then selected. They get selection notices, and based on that selection notice, the company is able to file the H-1B petition. And the window being from April 1st to June 30th, so that that is our window to then actually file the H-1B petition. Um, this has been really great to. Uh, from prior years where there was no registration system in the past uh, for for those folks who've been doing this um, long enough, you'd remember that there was a whole scramble to actually file an entire petition by April 1. And then it was a, a waste of resources, time and money to, to do this and then have those files returned if they were not um, selected in a lottery. So the system is actually working and um, and it is a lot more efficient uh, than the prior system. Um, Thanks, Naveen. And I just want to add to that, you know, the registration, like Naveen says, really um, kind of a simplified uh, process and it really requires only basic information. But we do recommend having our firm handle the registration so we can step in and assist with any technical glitches that does happen quite often on the USCIS website. Um, and then we can also review the registration information to make sure that you're not missing anyone, that you're not, you don't have any duplicates. Um, which is critical because if you are one company registering the same individual twice, that could lead to disqualification of a selection. So, um, right. Thank you, Naveen. So if, you're, if your employee's case is selected, um, what's the next step? Uh, the next step is to prepare, like Naveen said, the actual CAP H-1B petition filing with the government. And there's the 90-day window to file. And you can file at any time during that window. Um, notably, though, it's important to file early within the window if you have an employee in F1 status and their EAD is going to expire um, in you know, April, May, or June. So that's something that you will want to monitor really closely with your immigration firm. Um, it's best to file uh, also early in the window for anybody who um, you know, has has other non-immigrant issues that you need to anticipate. Uh, many of our clients have us prepare the LCA prior to April 1st so that we can vet the prevailing wage issues in advance uh, for them. Um, but others want to just have us assist with the registration and then handle the wage issues later. So we're happy to talk more um, about the pros and cons of each option if you want to reach out to us and explore those. Uh, so between April 1st and June 30th, we file the petition with the government, and then we'll provide uh, to you updates regarding the receipt notice, so if there's a request for evidence, and then the decision. So the H-1B can be filed in one of two ways. Uh, the first possible strategy is called counselor notification. And that means that the company is asking for the H-1 petition to be approved, but not activate the employee's H-1 status. So basically the approval sits there in your back pocket until the employee travels internationally, applies for a visa stamp and activates the H-1 status by coming back into the United States. Um, it's, it's important to know that when you activate or when the employee activates H-1 status, the dates for the H-1 period is basically fixed to what the approval was for. So, you know, let's say you have an employee who activates their H-1 status one year after the H-1 is approved uh, via consular notification, they don't get another three-year period. It, the end date is what is noted on the approval notice, which is the initial dates that you requested. Um, so consular notification might be necessary if, um, as opposed to change of status, if the employee has a need to travel abroad while the H-1 petition is pending. Um, and if that's the case, it's really important that the employee has another underlying status to bring them to at least, you know, October 1 or later um, so that your, you, your employee doesn't have a gap in work authorization. Um, consular notification is also required if the employee is going to be outside of the United States when the petition is filed. Um, we can definitely coordinate with you to determine the best strategy for your situation. Um, if for people in F1 status, um, sometimes you know your employees might come to you and say, I don't really want to do change of status. I want to do consular notification because I want to maximize the the tax benefits, uh, because if you're in F1 status, for example, FICA and FUTA tax withholdings are not um, activated. So they're postponed 
until the employee is steps into H1 status, so that that might come up. Um, and then, particularly in COVID and with consular delays, um, you know, it, it's important to plan out when the employee uh, travels abroad to activate the consular uh, case because you know they might find themselves uh, stuck abroad for some time. There may be an uptick in administrative processing for certain countries as well, so that's important to consider and factor into your planning. And I think change of status is the more common method where the employee is already in the US. Um, and what that means is that, that you're requesting that the H-1 be approved and the status become effective as early as October 1st, if the petition is approved by that time. Um, and basically, so you know, if the employee is in F-1 status or other status and the CAP H-1 is approved, uh, prior to October 1st or on October 1st, they basically wake up on October 1st and they're already in H1 status, no additional action is needed, so long as they remained in the United States throughout the pendency of the case. And so as of October 1st, you want to update your company's NN records if, if, if applicable. Um, and change of status is really, really important for students uh, or employees who are F1 students um, who need cap gap work authorization protection, which Naveen's going to go into more detail in the next slide. Um, and I already mentioned this, but the employee has to be physically you know, present in the US when the cap H1B is filed. And so if you have an employee who is thinking about traveling sometime between you know, the lottery and June 30th, it's really important to plan it out carefully with your immigration attorney. Um, right. And so if, if someone does travel while the change of status case is pending, then USCIS is gonna treat that change of status application uh, or request as being abandoned. And so it, they'll automatically adjudicate it as a consular notification case. Okay, Naveen, can you address the cap gap situation? Sure. Um, so I, I do see that we're starting to get some questions. So uh, Mickey will just answer those at the end. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sounds good. Great. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so for cap gap, um, it is a, a situation where someone is working for you know on, on the OPT or the STEM OPT, and their most folks have their STEM OPTs or OPTs expiring in the summer because they typically graduate in May or June and their OPTs start June, July, August. Um, and so then you have a situation where the H-1B is not starting until October 1 and there is a potential break in their employment authorization um, between the OPT expiration and the H-1B start date. So the cap gap was um, is now offered so that if you have an H-1B petition that was selected and you apply for a change of status before the person's OPT expires, their OPT is then their work, work authorization and status is then extended through September 30th. And so if you have someone whose OPT is expiring in the first week of May of April, for example, then it's, um, you know, we would recommend having their case really ready to file as soon as you know their their uh, petition has been selected in the registration so that the application is filed before their OPT expires. And then, um, then ideally they would have that extension of their OPT. Once they get the receipt notice from the change of status filing, they should then go to their school, the university uh, DSO, and they'll get an updated I-20 um, that has the annotation for that cap gap extension. Um, the cap gap extension, meaning the extension of their work authorization is only until September 30th. So if there is a request for evidence on their petition and their petition remains pending beyond September 30th, um, they can remain in the United States, but they uh, will need to stop working um, because their employment authorization has ended as of September 30th. Uh, the other, a uh, note is that last year, well, I'm sorry, this year there was only one lottery draw, but um, in prior years, uh, 
USCIS did have multiple lottery draws of the registration. So if somebody's OPT expires and then there's a second lottery draw and they are able to apply for a change of status um, because their OPT had actually expired, they would not have that benefit of a cap gap extension. Um, all right, I think uh, with that, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, Okay, so now if uh, the employee is not selected, um, then there are some options. Um, the first being that, you know, if the employer has affiliate companies abroad and it, it makes sense to transfer the employee to an, an office abroad, then they can spend a year abroad uh, in a specialty um, a specialized knowledge or managerial role, and then return to the US um, the following year after being abroad for a year on an L1 visa as an intercompany transfer. Um, or they, you know, while they're abroad, they can also um, apply for the, the next year's lottery and see if they have better luck. But um, but just to keep in mind that the the H1B start is in October, so it may just coincide that if they were to be abroad, that they may be able to return more quickly on an L visa instead of waiting for the H-1B to come through. Um, the other potential is a concurrent H-1B with a company that's cap exempt. So as I mentioned earlier, um, if you're going to be working for an institution that is not subject to the H-1B cap, then you can have concurrent H-1B with a cap subject company. Uh, so we have seen folks do this where they have a part-time job with a university affiliate. And then once that's uh, approved, then they can file a concurrent H-1B um, with a cap subject company um, probably the one where they were not selected in the H-1B lottery. So this is another way to, uh, to be able to stay here, but, but just keep in mind that the H-1B that's concurrent um, for the CAP subject company is um, relies on the person still maintaining their employment with the CAP exempt, that university affiliated institution. Uh, the other option is that the student, if they're, they are here on a student visa or OPT, that they return to school um, for another degree, or um, if the, they're going into a master's program and that program offers curricular practical training, there may be an opportunity for that individual to continue working on CPT. Um, the CPTs are granted per semester and are based on what the course um, offers and if um, if it is something where the job is linked to the, the course and related to what they're studying. So in, in those situations, they can get CPT. Um, Thanks, Naveen. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, as Cap H1 lottery selection numbers have kind of fluctuated, we have seen some people uh, turn to that F1 CPT option. But I think it's important to know it's not without some risk, right? Um, some uh, previous administrations, well, the Trump administration um, really focused on scrutinizing uh, people who were not selected in H-1B or uh, and, and uh, re-enrolled in school to pursue day one CPT. So that's um, important to think about. I think in this current administration, it hasn't been much of an issue, but you know, it can change um, as the administrations change as well. Yeah, and there are a lot of universities that may offer CPT and, and some just to be careful on some of these programs, um, they have come under scrutiny where the, the, the school itself has come under scrutiny. And um, so just to be careful when selecting a CPT program. Absolutely. And so other options that might uh, come up, you know, if people are citizens of countries where there are bilateral um, agreements with, you know, for example, Canada, Australia, Singapore, or Chile, uh, there might be special visa categories that are available. And then if the if your employee is a dependent of a spouse that has an H-1B uh, and eligible for an H-4EAD or L-2 or um, E-3, for example, those might be potential options for you as well. Okay, uh, great. So next we're going to turn to uh, the recession 
the upcoming or potential recession. Naveen, do you want to go ahead and start that conversation? Sure. Yeah, I know there's been a lot in, of news lately on corporate layoffs. Um, Amazon made it, you know, there was an announcement on Amazon yesterday, Twitter, Meta. So um, we've been talking about how this may affect um, the this coming year's uh, registration and selection. So um, I guess to start the discussion, uh, Mickey, if you can just talk about what the numbers have looked like in the past in terms of numbers of registrations. Sure. Yeah, so this past um, April lottery, you know, uh, fiscal year 2023, uh, selection rates were at 26%, which is a drastic change from the previous year, fiscal year 2022. So that was the lottery that was run in April of 2021. Selection rates were around 42%. Um, and, you know, demand really seemed to have surged um, this year. And interestingly, you know, USCIS published this data, and we thought it was interesting the fact that in fiscal year 2022, they got about 308,000 registrations and selected um, 87,500 in the first selection and then more in the second drawing. And then there was a third drawing uh, for a total of 131,970 selections. And that's to fill the 85,000 slots. So we thought it was really interesting because basically, you know, USCIS draws about 40,000 to 50,000 selections that go unused. Um, in, FY 2023, they got about 30% more in registrations compared with FY 2022. Um, and they selected, uh, they got over um, 483,000 registrations and selected 127,600 registrations for the 85,000. So I um, thought that was interesting. Uh, so Naveen, do you have a crystal ball reading? No, but, but Nikki, why do you think immigration selected so many for, you know, like almost, what did you say, 180 for 85,000? Uh, let's see, 127,000 for 85,000. So yeah, like 40,000 to 50,000 numbers that go unused. I think, you know, part of it is the IT consulting companies that really kind of flood the, the registrations. Um, they, because of the lower barrier to entry into registrations, um, it's relatively easy, like we talked about, right? We don't have to put in a hard copy filing with a full prepared petition. It's really just some basic information in the registration period. So uh, probably more companies are you know, just throwing in the registrations and, and then once they're selected, making the decision whether to transfer the uh, individual uh, to, into the United States on the H1. Um, I, I think that's part of it. Do you have any other theories to Naveen? Or potentially the employees are have multiple job offers. I, you know, um, so you can't have the same employer file um, for the same individual have duplicate filings, but um, but uh, one individual could have unrelated companies filing for them as well. Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely agreed. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So what this means for the upcoming registration period, certainly with um, with the layoffs, um, there are there there is talent out there who um, have been, you know, potentially on H-1B visas. And um, and so for companies that are looking to hire more experienced individuals, um, they, that's great because they are cap exempt since they've already been counted towards the H-1B cap. Um, and that may reduce the number of new H-1B petitions that are filed if the um, if an employer can hire someone who's already been counted towards the H-1B cap. It certainly takes um, away some of that uncertainty and risk in in um, in hiring that individual if if it's unknown whether or not they're going to be selected. Um, so based on that, there there might be less registrations happening this year. Um, or uh, you know the other one is if companies just aren't hiring anymore. Um, we've haven't really seen that with our clients. It, it, it appears so far that, you know, um, um, most of our corporate clients are still um, hiring as, and it appears still to be business as usual for, for us. But um, certainly if you are thinking about uh, whether or not to do registrations um, or for, you know, individuals who've been working for you remotely, from different countries, we definitely recommend trying for the H-1B lottery this coming year. Nikki, do you have any speculations on that? 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's really hard to say. I mean, it's such a weird market because, you know, some some of our corporate clients are still, you know, hiring like crazy um, and trying to catch up in terms of headcount and talent, I think, to pre-COVID levels. And then you're here in the news, some companies that maybe some specific industries, right, that are laying off on mass. So I think, I mean, even the economists, I think, don't really know what to make of this. So I, I certainly yeah. won't try to, I certainly won't <laughs> try to speculate too much, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it all develops. Um, okay, so what do companies have to think about in a recession? Um, you know, in a RIF, our attorneys would work with you to assess the impact on each foreign nationals, non-immigrant status, and if they have an ongoing green card case. Um, here, of course, on today's webinar, we're going to focus on the cap season um, and people who do enter into HMB status. Um, so, uh, Naveen, I guess in, in a corporate restructuring, um, how would you advise a client about you know, STEM holders? How might they be impacted? Yeah, actually, um, I, I am seeing a lot more corporate restructuring happening in the last year, um, where sometimes the business units are consolidating certain functions, or um, there's a lot more acquisitions happening. And this can certainly affect the, the foreign nationals who are on, on some form of work visa. Um, for the STEM OPT, so just to take a step back, um, STEM is a um, is, is a continuation of the OPT that's offered after someone graduates. Um, and if they're graduating from a STEM field, um, so the science, technology, engineering, math, um, then they can get an additional two years of their OPT, uh, but the employer, their direct employer has to be registered with E-Verify. And there are situations where in a in a company, only one or two business units may be registered with E-Verify. And so you just have to be careful that if you are hiring an individual with the expectation that you can do a STEM extension, that their payroll and their actual employer needs to be the registered E-Verify company. Um, we have uh, seen companies who were not previously registered for E-Verify actually now um, register because of this additional benefit of uh, being able to extend someone's OPT for an additional two years. And that way they can also have an opportunity to try for the H-1B lottery at least once or twice um, after, after their OPT expires. There are additional requirements for um, the STEM OPT that's different from a regular OPT. For the STEM OPT, the employer needs to complete with the student um, employee what's called a Form I-983, and that basically goes into some detail about the work and the training that they're going to receive um, through this, this job opportunity. And that really needs to be linked and related to their program of study. Once this form 983 is completed, the student then presents it to their university. If they're okay with it, the university issues a form I-20 with that updated STEM um, annotation. And then based on that I-20, the student can then apply for an extension of their OPT as long as this extension is filed uh, within the, you know, before their current OPT expires, they would have an automatic extension of 180 days um, until they receive that, that new uh, card. Um, there are additional requirements for the employer to, uh, to provide reports on, on the student. And then just also to keep in mind that if you're hiring someone who already has a STEM OPT, or they're going to be transitioning between business units, that they do need to um, uh, have to file a new Form 983 with the university within uh, 10 days of starting the new job. Um, so, so that's with the uh, with the STEM. And then also, whenever there is an extension or um, any kind of change in somebody's work authorization to always make sure that um, that the form I-9 is, is updated with the STEM extension. Also, when, as Mickey mentioned, when they change status to the H-1B. Um, so Mickey, if you could talk about other uh, filing and corporate yeah, stuff. Sure. Um, so as most of you probably know, the H-1B lottery selection is specific to the petitioning employer and the sponsored employee. So the selection isn't transferable 
uh, you know, to another employee. Um, and it's also not transferable from one employer to another. And so I wanted to kind of break down three possible scenarios for uh, what might happen if your company restructures uh, its organization during cafe tron season. And you know, the first scenario is if the restructuring happens um, and the sponsored employees reassign to another entity, uh, for example, like in the situation that Naveen mentioned with consolidation, for example. Uh, if that happens during the registration period, then you, know, you can make the update in the USCIS portal until that window closes. Um, so that's sort of the, the easy scenario. The second scenario is if the uh, corporate sort of reassignment and reorganization takes place after the lottery selection and the employee sponsored by one entity is now maybe assigned to work under a parent entity or the parent entity or another subsidiary or, uh, or affiliated organization. Uh, that's a really tricky situation in which, you know, the company might still be able to file the H-1B petition under limited circumstances. Um, if the company can demonstrate a tight nexus, the relationship between those two entities. Um, it might be possible, you know, if you your employee is moving from a subsidiary to a parent or parent to subsidiary possibly, um, but it may not be possible if the employee was sponsored by one subsidiary and now moving laterally to another subsidiary. So this is a really tricky situation. So, uh, you know, please definitely reach out to us and we can work through all of that. If the corporate restructuring is an acquisition, the employer may be able to file so long as you can establish that the petitioning parent entity is a successor in interest. Then the next scenario is if the H-1 petition has already been approved under one entity and the new employer is a successor in interest, then you can make that case, work with your attorney on that. But if it is not um, a successor in interest, then the new petitioning entity may be able to, you know, would have to file a change of employer. Um, you know, it, in certain circumstances, you'll be able to do that even if the um, H-1B that was approved for one entity hasn't been activated yet. So. Uh, again, really complicated scenarios, and we'd be happy to explore with you if that were to happen. Uh, in these situations, you know, one thing to consider is, as Naveen and, and I have been mentioning several times throughout this webinar, that USCIS does not allow um, a company to enter an employee more than once into the lottery. Otherwise, it would lead to disqualification. And the reason for that is USCIS really wants to make sure that there's no unfair um, uh, increase in the chances of selection by a company trying to, you know, use the differing corporate structures to kind of circumvent the one employee, one company rule. Um, and so, you know, you might be, run into problems with that rule if an employee is moved from one entity to another, um, you know, so the the um, tip here is if you have the opportunity to plan ahead, um, if you have advanced information, then you might want to be, you may be able to strategize about that um, by, for example, thinking about filing under a parent entity. Um, if there is legitimately uh, indicia of an employer, the parent entity being the employer, and ultimately exercising control um, over the employment of an employee, kind of even if there is a subsidiary in between, there may be a case to be made that you can file the petition, the registration and the petition with the parent entity as the petitioner and the employer. Um, if that's the case, then moving an employee from one subsidiary to another within that same parent organization may not have a negative impact um, in a restructuring or reorganization. It won't work for all companies necessarily, uh, you know, because the direction and control um, piece might not be there. Uh, so, you know, some examples of what to look for um, uh, in a parent entity being the one ultimately exercising direction and control might be factors like who makes the hire and fire decisions. 
uh, who supervises the employee ultimately and does performance evaluations, and which entity runs payroll. It's not limited to those, um, but those are some starting points for you to think about um, in terms of determining whether it would be a good strategy for you to use the parent entity as petitioner. I know yeah, that was are, a lot. <laughs> no, no, those are all really great points. You know, the other thing is potentially just to file the petition with the um, with the entity that filed the registration, and then consider doing an amended filing. You know, once things down the line. settle down down the line, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. There's a lot of movement sometimes with just with the employee deciding to go work in a different state, and that may trigger an amendment filing as well. Great. So Naveen, can you talk about um, if it's not a reorg, but um, a termination or RIF that happens to H-1B employees? Yep. So um, if there is early termination, meaning that the person's employment ends before their petition, they do have a 60-day grace period, um, during which time they can um, depart the United States, file another H-1B change of employer petition, um, or file for a change of status. So if their spouse is here on, on another visa, such as a student visa or work visa, they can file for a change of status to the dependent status. Or um, if they need a little bit more time to pack up their things, then they can also apply for a change of status to the B2, which is the tourist visa. Um, so all of those um, need to be done within the 60 days. And uh, the company is supposed to offer the, the cost for a return ticket home for the individual. So that needs to be documented that that offer was made um, to the individual. And, uh, and then how you actually pay the individual is, is really up to the company if they um, actually book the flights for the individual or, or provide a, a certain amount towards a ticket that would be considered fair. So um, so there is this uh, 60 days. Now, what we do see um, sometimes with the H-1B cap case um, folks who may or may not then um, start working for that H-1B employers uh, is we, it is my recommendation to at least, if it's possible to start working for the, um, the employer through which the person got their CAP H-1B petition, and then after that switch, do a change of um, employer petition so that um, those, are, I would say, are, are the cleanest if, if it's possible to actually employ that person for at least through October, November, um, and then do the change of employer. Great. Thanks, Naveen. Um, all right. So before we um, turn to Q&A, here's some takeaways for you for next steps. So kind of a timeline. Uh, so now's really a good time to look at your entire employee population and try to capture people who are not in H-1B status already. So, you know, people who might be in J-1 status or TN or dependent work statuses. Um, one way to, to do this is to look through your I-9 I records and your reports to make sure you're catching everybody that needs to be sponsored. Um, and then, you know, even if uh, you have an F1 student who has uh, two or maybe three years of OPT time available to them, uh, we would encourage you to enter them into the lottery at the first available opportunity, precisely because of the low selection rates that we addressed earlier. And then, uh, you know, between now and January, um, reach out to us to initiate the cases and work to provide the job details to WR if you would like for us to vet the prevailing wages and any uh, issues that might be anticipated and you know, generally eligibility for the H-1B classification. And by February, we want to have a finalized list of registrations so that we can cross-check all of the information, uh, all of the details and prepare the registrations, make sure there are no duplicates in there. Um, and then have you review to make sure that you have nobody else to add. And then in March, we would enter the lottery registrations and fingers crossed until the end of March when hopefully we get the results. So with that, we'd like to turn to the Q&A. Um, so Mickey, the first one is um, the employee um, is going to get a degree in the future in, in April, or they're mm -hmm. going to be graduating in June, um, are they eligible for the registration in March? 
So um, if the individual has uh, completed all of their program requirements, that is possible. Uh, but really, the default is to have the diploma and graduation be completed before the April uh, before the April uh, date. Do you have anything to add, Naveen? There, um, I would, you know, for people who already have a bachelor's degree, and we know that they're going to be um, graduating with a master's degree um, before June thirtieth. We've actually been able to put them through the master's cap, um, but we would request that they um, have at least a letter or something from their registrars um, showing that that they are in fact going to have completed all their degree requirements, so that they will have that in hand by by the deadline filing, which is uh, June thirtieth. Great. Um, the next question is, um, I think a, a, a client of ours, when does WR ask for information to apply for the HMB lottery? Um, when should I follow up for the HMB uh, information? So we're already starting to have these discussions with our um, with our clients, and um, they're I know they're putting their list together. We um, so the discussions have have started. Um, I think uh, a lot of um, HR will reach out maybe December January um, because we are asking for that list if possible by by end of January. Um, so I would say the discussions have already started on on my side. How about you? For you, Mickey. Yeah, we've started. Um, we haven't reached out across the board, but we have started with some. And so please feel free to reach out to your uh, attorney if you already have one that you're working with um, and we can start the process. The next question is with the lottery in March, are employees eligible to begin working for the company say January 1? Um, I mean, I can take that one. So the lottery in March, 2023, um, employees, whether they can start working before the lottery happens really hinges on if they have work authorization available to them through other means that's not H1B related. So if they're a student, do they have a valid OPT card or do they have a curricular practical training? Um, if they have other statuses like TN or uh, something like that, um, is it valid all the way to uh, October 1st? So for anybody who has status other than F1, their status really should um, go all the way to October 1st of 2023 in order to avoid any break in work authorization. Um, as Naveen talked about, if you have somebody in F1 status and their OPT expires sometime between April 1st and June 30th, then you can get, uh, sorry, April 1st and September 30th, you can get cap gap protection for them. Um, next question is, okay, does a US-based online master's degree count? Do you want to take that one, Naveen? Or do you want me to um, <laughs> so uh, there are certain requirements for the, um, for the master's. Um, I believe it can't be a for-profit institution. So we would need to know a little bit more about the online program. Um, and the institution that's granting the, the master's degree. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question about J-1 holders. Um, yeah. If they have a home country residential requirement to fulfill, is there anything the company needs to do, uh, needs to take into consideration before putting them in the H-1B lottery? That's a great question. So um, it, can take a while to get a waiver of that J-1 two-year home residence requirement. Um, so certainly they should start the process. Uh, typically it's, it's done through what's called a no objection uh, letter from their home country, but it can take well over six months to complete the process. So if someone is subject to the J-1, um, they should start that waiver process. You don't need the waiver to be granted to do the registration. Um, now, if they're then selected in the lottery and they're, they're still J-1 subject or their waiver hasn't been granted, um, you could do a consular notification J-1, uh, sorry, H-1, um, and then just make a note that this individual will have completed their waiver obligation or their um, 
sorry, the, the waiver or their two-year obligation before getting their H-1B visa, um, they cannot do a change of status until the, um, the waiver is granted or they've completed that two-year obligation. So uh, you can certainly do the registration, start the J-1 waiver process, um, and then depending on whether or not they're selected and how far along they are in the waiver process, it would either be a change of status or consular notification. Great, thanks. Um, how about this one? Does using premium processing increase the chances of selection in the lottery? No, because the premium processing only kicks in once someone is selected and uh, you're actually filing the petition. So there is no premium processing for the registration, but once um, you are selected, then you know we can talk to your attorney on whether or not it makes sense to do premium processing. Sometimes there's a strategy reason to do premium processing. Um, we don't see really a correlation on higher requests for evidence for premium processing on H's. And then I guess as a follow-up question to that is, does the premium process increase chances of approval? I haven't, I haven't seen, you know, greater approval rates or more requests for evidence with premium processing. Um, Mickey, have you? No, I mean I think as a as a whole, our our firm has you know near perfect approval rates in most cases. Uh, but yeah, no, it doesn't it doesn't increase the chance of um, approval or, you know, getting an RFE or anything like that. I mean, I think it is just, you know, the benefits of premium processing is to have improved, you know, processing timelines, obviously, and also improved access to USCIS if something, you know, there's an issue that comes up. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, what if you have an employee who might change titles between the time of registration and filing? Does that matter? So for the registration, we don't need to provide any details about the actual position. It's really the company and the individual. So there, it's it's totally fine to have a change of um, position offered um, during the registration period. But once the petition is prepared or filed, um, that's actually when when there may be a requirement to do an amended filing. So for the registration, it's okay. What about change of locations? Is it the same? For the registration, it's totally fine. Um, but once the petition is filed, um, depending on where the location is, there there may be a requirement to do an amended filing. Okay, great. Um, okay, I think we have. I mean, there's a there's some questions related to we we be sharing the recording and the powerpoints, and yes, we will do that. Um, Okay, can an employee hold H-1B status while they still have STEM OPT time left? Do you wanna take that? Do you want me to take that? Um, yeah, I can take that. Uh, yep, um, absolutely fine for an employee to have H-1 status uh, while there's STEM OPT time left. Um, you might hear from you know, employees who say, well, I wanna kind of delay uh, stepping into H-1B status because of the tax benefits that you receive if you're an F-1 status, um, as in you don't have to um, have your FICA and FUTA um, deductions taken out of payroll uh, paychecks. Um, but from a legal perspective, absolutely fine to switch right into H-1B status, even if you are early in your OPT or STEM OPT period. And, you know, there are some people who uh, don't also want to activate their H-1B right away because there is a limit of six years of H-1B time. And so if you do have OPT and, or STEM OPT that, you know, is valid for another two years, then um, in that situation, the consular notification may be the way to go. And then you would uh, continue on the F-1 um, STEM OPT and then activate the H-1B close to the expiration of your STEM OPT. Great, thanks, Naveen. Um, I just want to go back one slide and share with everybody that um, our firm is holding holding a webinar December thirteenth for a more global um, perspective on the recession. So please um, please register and attend. 
Uh, it'll be our, one of our attorneys, Laura Bolognars, and Audrey Lustgarden, who is a managing partner of our global practice. And it should be a really great discussion. And they will touch upon some of the issues that we did not touch upon today because they relate to uh, US green card processes, for example, and the impact on an employer's ability to sponsor um, firm applications for a period of time in the event of a RIF. Great, well, thank you everybody for um, attending today and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.